Good evening. My name is Juliana Camfield. I'm the director here at Deutsches Haus at NYU. Welcome to Pen World Voices, Lit Crawl NYC, the literary muse. Welcome to Deutsches Haus at NYU. And it is my pleasure, of course, to have this wonderful panel here tonight. And Atina uh, will take over momentarily because we only have 50 minutes. So it has to be super short. We will not provide lengthy introductions. If you're interested in these guys' biographical information, we have a bio sheet outside. And I will just briefly, super briefly, introduce Atina, who is a professor of history at the Cooper Union and also a good friend of Deutsches Haus at NYU. That shall suffice. All the other accomplishments can be read or she can talk about them and then the event will be over, <laughs> so, so she won't talk about it. Uh, let me just uh, briefly thank the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, uh, for uh, sponsoring the DAAD Poetics Chair, and that's Katja Petrovskaya. We are externally, not externally, uh, eternally, <laughs> externally, eternally grateful to the DAAD for their support. And now let me just check if I forgot something. And of course, this is teaching in times of trouble. I forgot to mention the event, but uh, we are in times of trouble teaching or not, and now I will hand things over. Please join me in welcoming this illustrious panel. Okay, good evening and thank you, Juliana. And um, yes, welcome to this conversation on teaching in times of trouble, university as sanctuary, and I think there's a big question mark uh, after that uh, second uh, phrase. And uh, yes, this is a lightning round. Uh, we have very little time, and we have uh, three really extraordinarily uh, you know, distinguished and exciting uh, writers, intellectuals, artists uh, from various backgrounds uh, with us today. Uh, Katja Petrovskaya and Rosamund uh, King, <laughs> I was going to say Rosamund King, and um, Francine Prose. And um, in view of the uh, time, I think we're just going to launch right into the discussion. And uh, you will just believe that these are three very, very special people we're hearing from. And uh, with different experiences in, at, at, in terms of teaching, which in a sense is our focus today. Uh, and really, the first question is, we are obviously living in troubled times. And um, how do we, how do you uh, think about teaching uh, in our moment right now, uh, here, but also in maybe other places where you teach and work? I teach at Bard. I teach a literature literature class, and uh, I mean, I have to say that things have changed quite a bit since the election. I mean, right after the election, uh, my students were incredibly disturbed, and I felt that I, I all I could do was try and help them back from the place that they were after the election. I teach a liter literature class, and um, and I believe in it. I mean, I believe that if you teach a kind of uh, a way in which students can connect themselves to the individual writer, to something that's been done centuries before in a different place, in a different culture, in a different society, you're broadening them and uh, expanding their ways of thinking in the world in a way that's more necessary than ever now. It's never seemed so important to me. So, so I feel very good about what I do in the same sense that I feel that it's harder than, than ever because the pressures they're under and the pressures they're facing uh, have grown more intense. So uh, it's our responsibility really to keep encouraging them to care about literature, to care about writing, to care about individuals, to care about things that have happened in other times and other places and other cultures and, and to make these things alive and vital and meaningful for them and, and that's part of my job. So you are teaching in a bucolic place at Bard, and then Rosamond, you're teaching at Brooklyn College. I know, and you have taught in many other places, 
but maybe from your perspective, what that means? We're not bucolic, but we do have one of the prettiest campuses okay. of the <laughs> uni system. We have a lovely lily pond. Um, I, I mean, I would agree with everything that you've said, uh, but one of the things that fr frustrates me a bit is that I feel like we've always been teaching in troubled times and that the present kind of anxiety can mask some of the things that were going on before. So it's been many years since Barnes and Noble took over the bookstore where I teach. And so when I want to teach a book that's been published outside of the country or from a very small press, there has to be permission granted from the head office, right? So <laughs> that affects what we so-called academic freedom, right? The lists of supposedly politically radical professors precedes this administration. And so you add on to that the, um, the anxiety of students who's, who, whose very lives are at stake, right? Um, and particularly because I teach at a public institution, it's not um, theoretical or academic what the students are dealing with. But there's a reason that I don't teach political science right, or that I don't teach anthropology. And I still believe that it is important to teach literature, to teach writing. I think that reading and writing can be themselves acts of insurrection. They can both teach us how to be in this moment and also be respites from this moment kind of in different ways, so. Yeah, you already mentioned what I wanted to, to mention because actually uh, first, um, um, we are, we always live in troubled time uh, times, and actually, I grew up in the Soviet Union, and uh, uh, in my family, there are like seven generations of teachers uh, who actually started with teaching uh, deaf and mute kids. Uh, uh, and uh, if you are approaching that, uh, uh, we were always troubled, and. Uh, um, and uh, uh, maybe it's it's also a sort of uh, East European arrogance, you know. Uh, I, I really feel very strange uh, talking to many people here about troubles of uh, Trump. Uh, um, because anyway, in comparison to, uh, to our life, I'm not a refugee, I'm not in danger, I have a Ukrainian pass. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 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 our spiritual uh, um, uh, experience has nothing to do with the experience of many people here, and I was really, a few times, really shocked when, like, a very famous writer uh, is telling everybody that it's the first time, and he's like 60 years old, you know, it's the first time in our life when we're in this situation. What? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a very, very strange uh, thing. Why actually the the uh, the history and uh, and troubles of black people is not a history of white people who grew up here, and uh, why the history and troubles of people who immigrated from many countries, and actually it's one of the main points of U U.S., you know, we're immigrant country and all that, and even in this resistance uh, um, process, uh, it's one of the main points, we're a, a, a country of immigrants. So, and it means simply to adopt the stories of these immigrants. It means that actually everybody who had a beautiful life uh, uh, studying and teaching here uh, uh, um, can describe himself and can adopt these stories. So we, we are, in a way, always in trouble. Uh, we in Europe are very, very uh, European-centered uh, uh, with all our bloodlands. And I, I mean, I grew up in Kiev. Uh, I studied in Moscow and Estonia. I live in Berlin. And uh, it's, a, it's a bloodland, you know, and you feel it every day. So uh, it's not a matter of time. It's a, also a matter of topography. It's a matter of, uh, I mean, everybody has its, his own map of empathy, you know, and uh, uh, sometimes it's really hard to explain uh, how it was formed. It, it, it's not always a matter of biography. It's also a matter of reading. I think you've raised this question of the balance between recognizing that trouble times is a relative term, and some people have had more troubled histories than others, and, uh, and, and that that matters. Uh, but I think that it is the case that, uh, that in the US, or cer certainly for our students, uh, that something does feel different. Something has shifted. 
uh, well, at least I would suggest it has. Uh, and, uh, you know, and whether that has to do with worrying about your visas or whether that has to do with worrying about being undocumented or whether it has to do with, as one of you said, worrying about how you're going to talk to your parents or your, or your aunt who voted for Trump. Uh, it, it, I think it does raise this question again of, yes, you know, what, what are the challenges that, that we as, yes, privileged academics teaching in uh, universities and also uh, having other careers uh, in, in culture have right now with students for whom this may be familiar from their family histories, from their own experience, but um, also feels, I think, in some ways <coughs> new and, and scary in a different way. So I don't know whether somebody has some thoughts about that this is a different moment and how do we respond? Do we have a particular responsibility? Do we do something different or do we just do what we do as well as we, as we can? Which I think maybe is what you were suggesting, Francine. Well, I, I agree that, that, that the election of Trump has brought certain things to the surface, but he's not the cause. He's the symptom of things that have been here for a very long time. So, so part of what we're doing, I think, is to talk about what's, what he's symptomatic of. But, but I was saying earlier that, that, for example, this past semester, I taught a class in strange books, and I just picked the 15 strangest books I could think of. And, and I was very fortunate because I had students uh, from all over. I mean, I had two Russian uh, girls, a Hungarian girl, a, a boy from the DR, um, a Mexican boy. So, and we, and and my reading list, because I felt free to do that, was was came from all over the world. And one of the things I did was to teach these texts, of course, in English translation, but to look at where my students came from and to choose texts that came from the places they came from, so that they could read it in the original and translate it mm. as we were going along, and in some cases very necessarily because the translations weren't that good. So for example, to teach uh, the great, and, and it just happened by accident. I mean, the week after the election, um, I taught the great Mexican novel, Pedro Paramo, which, uh, which is a, you know, a great novel, exists in English in two very bad translations. And it was just when Trump was, was most vehemently speaking about our need to deport the bad hombres or blah, blah, blah. And, and my student from the DR and my daughter-in-law, who's Mexican, came to class and translated along with the original text. And, and the beauty of these texts and the complexities of these texts the students could not help but notice. I mean, they knew anyway, because they're wonderful kids. They knew anyway, but, but I felt very good about teaching a novel from a rich, complicated, beautiful culture that at that moment mm. was being portrayed as, a, as an evil culture. And, and I was happy, you know, I mean, my students still had problems, but at the end of that class, I was very glad to have done that. Or, or Russian, I mean, I taught, um, a novel by Andrei Platonov, one of the most difficult Russian writers, the most badly and difficult translated Russian writers. And my two Russian students brought the original text in and were translating along with the English text. And, and the students got the sense of what cannot be translated, of what exists in one culture that doesn't exist in another culture, a way of, that one culture has of looking at the world. And, and you know, it's just a literature class. It's just a literature, mm -hmm. literature class. And yet, I feel that because we're doing this, this sort of broad internationalist uh, reading list, the students leave the class with a different sense of what it means to live in a broader world, which I, I don't know what could be more important now. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> What's the um, order? Okay. I mean, you, you asked the question, do we do anything differently? I yeah. think we both kind of do what we've always done, but I think what good teachers do is always be responsive, right? Both to the moment and to the time. So I've been teaching 
um, Amy Césaire's discourse on colonialism. Mm -hmm. And you know, every once in a while when we're talking about it, like I would say, so we wouldn't know anything about this, would we? <laughs> right? Police states and him saying, you know, Europe cannot stand in the way that it is and so on. Um, and I think that that, that, I think part of it is about listening to the students and giving them space to have conversations amongst themselves. One of the things that's wonderful about the university system in this country is it is the one time that people are most likely to have deep conversations with people who are not like themselves. And most of the people who go to university in this country after university go back to communities or to socializing with communities that are very much like themselves. And so to have that opportunity for students to not just read the text but have talk talk to each other, not across each other, right? And have, um, and I think because I'm, I largely teach literature, although in this country when you teach Caribbean and African literature, you also have to teach history and geography, um, that they're not directly talking about the current events, and so the kind of acerbicness that can come out from that is a little bit more absent, and yet we can still have conversations about how we relate to human beings, how we should treat other people, what does it mean for one country to interact with another country, and so on. I have almost nothing to, to say because I just started to teach. It was my uh, first class in my life, um, because maybe it was a part of my a general resistant, uh, resistance uh, not to teach because I have this uh, crazy family. Um, and actually, maybe, uh, maybe teaching for me was always a sort of um, imposing the will, you know, like, um, and uh, thinking about class now, uh, I was thinking more, not about uh, a more in situation, in more in political situation, but about one story. Uh, one friend from Columbia University told me he said that in the last three years he has like seven suicide stories and uh, actually uh, I mean uh, it's also about politics uh, uh, it's also about uh, dictatorship so uh, and uh, in the more in the American situation I really didn't want to talk about uh, this situation because um, you know we are uh, uh, when times are changing, it's also a demand. Uh, um, they are demanding to uh, that we are changing, and sometimes actually, the only thing we can do just not to react on on on, on this. And maybe it's better sometimes to watch the clouds, or I don't know what, uh, because I I really sometimes don't want to accept the language of this kind of um, yeah. Uh, and I don't know how it influenced my class because actually my class was um, in in a way on hist uh, on historical memory and everything you are uh, you can tell about uh, war and peace and texts on that uh, it's it's always more than you know because anyway uh, um, anyway it's always more than and actually I uh, I went uh, on the first of May I I went uh, to the Washington Square and I felt like this. Giuseppe Garibaldi, who was staying there with his squad, you know, it's a very, very strange, uh, uh, strange sculpture because he's like trying to uh, to get his sword off of this. Uh, what's the word of? Uh, Scabbard, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he's like, uh, and that's actually maybe it's <laughs> a position of a teacher, you know, Lee. You're like uh, ready to defend, but uh, you are not allowed to use a weapon, and I don't know. So that, in a way, yeah. No, but in a way, it, I think you're all already moving into the next question, which is probably much too flat-footed for what you've already said, which is sort of how political, political, um, you know, should one be uh, in the classroom, but also I think with, within the within the university as a whole, or with you know within your academic context as as someone working in the academy, I think you've already started to suggest ways of complicating that question. But um, you know what 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 does it mean to be political in the classroom in a maybe particularly heightened politicized moment or in the university? Did you think of that differently now? No. 
Well, uh, I've never, ever made any effort to hide my own political feelings in the class. I've never, and I've, and I've said, you know where the dean's office is. You could just walk across campus if you're having a problem and just tell the dean. And we'll deal with it later. But I, but, but I also think that, that part of the atmosphere in the classroom that I want to encourage has to do with honesty mm -hmm. and has to do with the ability to say what you really believe and not mask what you really believe. And, and I feel that if I was being more in the other sense, politic and, and, and pretending not to think what I really think, I'd be doing my students a disservice. I mean, I, I think that it's important for me to be able to say, this is what I think, this is what's happening. I mean, when I first got to Bard, and this was before the current nightmare, uh, I taught this class called uh, Literature, Language, and Lies. And one of the things I did uh, was their out-of-class assignment was to take a news story that interested them and look at it in uh, the New York Times, <coughs> which we were pretending was this centrist paper, and, um, and then The Guardian, and then some right-wing newspaper of their choice, and just to look at the way that language was used to spin a particular story in three. And, it was, and the students, it was like a revelation for the students because they had always thought that you know a story is a story. And they would come to class and go, well, how come we bombed this maternity hospital in Baghdad and it's not being reported in the New York Times? So, so I felt then, and, and different things I'm doing now, that it was just part of my responsibility to wake them up to what was going on in the world. And uh, what a, you know, if I was going to get fired for it, I was going to get fired for it, whatever. <coughs> So far, that hasn't happened. And, and also, <laughs> I feel very grateful because I feel a great deal of support from the community that I teach in and from Leon Botstein and so on and so on. And, and you know, knock on wood, I don't think that's going to happen. But, uh, but I, don't, I can't imagine doing it any other way. So being out, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I don't think I'm quite as, ex I know that I'm not quite as explicit with my own um, personal political views. Um, because of what I look like, I walk into the room and people tend to think they know what my politics mm. are. And my, I really see, I see my role in the classroom largely as guiding students towards critical thinking, critical reading, and critical writing. And I do allow them to say things, um, as I'm sure you do as well, you know, that, that, dis, that, that are contrary to what my personal opinion is. And I don't share my personal opinion so that they have, I always say, you know, you can write about waffles as long as the text isn't about pancakes. Um, that if they can justify their argument, right, that, um, that that is what I am trying to guide them towards. And that in terms of critical reading, that similarly, you know, I, talk, I sometimes I'll, I'll show them things on Twitter and say, okay, let's, let's do a close reading. <laughs> Right, let's compare this. Um, and I think that there are other ways to kind of expose, you know, I, I, I taught at an institution once where students would regularly, just because of the, the type of, um, of population that, that I was teaching, whenever there was abuse in a novel, students would regularly say, well, she deserved it, right? And so instead of having a knee-jerk reaction against that, to actually critically examine that, well, okay, so did this man have any other options for how to treat this woman, right? Um, so, that's kind of how I, I come at it. And it's, I mean, it's not difficult to figure out. Um, some of my students are here. They probably could kind of do f know what I think. Um, but I also, in terms of the way even that I craft assignments, right? So students have to give country presentations, but they're not allowed to use CIA.gov, right? And then if the country is run by a dictator, they're not allowed to use the official website of the country. So just that in and of itself forces them to navigate even the internet and their research in a particular way that reveals to them that some of these texts are not saying the same story about how independence was achieved or what's happening in the contemporary moment in a particular place. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Next right. time. No, no, no. I, I, I really feel like um, I don't really fit in the picture because I'm like uh, really this kind of actually uh, teacher uh, uh, who tried to disobey and uh, disobey the whole life and, and not to teach, <laughs> and uh, um, 
and um, actually my students are sitting here and uh, it was a wonderful class and I'm very, very thankful. And, um, and I'm always thinking actually what is, what is actually to teach in English, it's very funny because it's almost to touch. And, um, and maybe it's, it's about creating a sort of uh, um, space of resonan resonance. Yeah, it's a, okay. And, uh, um, and sometimes you, you really don't need to, to point to certain political things. If you are creating this resonance, you are trying to, uh, to show your own um, uh, tuning fork, yeah, something like that. So, uh, and it's actually about uh, things like that. I don't know if I uh, can... Um, how much time then? Uh, if actually um, my life uh, or my existence even is a result of teaching in troubled times, uh, and maybe I can tell the story because uh, I can tell the story only about my mother, but not about myself. And um, uh, I was born 1970, and actually I always uh, always thought that it has something to do with uh, Prague Spring, because you know uh, actually all, um, all my uh, the whole my family pretends to be in the center of the history, <laughs> and um, uh, sometimes unfortunately it was the case. Um, and um, so uh, my mother was teaching history at school and my father had a sort of uh, like prohibition to work so he, he couldn't work many years so she was the only one who earned money uh, so uh, therefore maybe you understand when I'm here just in this university and I, I started in the Soviet Union when everything collapsed so actually it was a education was okay, uh, but we were never really privileged, you know, and I wrote PhD without uh, any, r any support. I don't know why I did it, uh, and it wasn't good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's a strange situation because I envy my, my students because they're like more dedicated than I, which is not difficult. And um, so my mother was teaching history and when Russian uh, uh, 68, and when Russian uh, uh, troops invaded Prague, uh, uh, she went to the. Um, if you, some of you don't know what is it, we will uh, we'll have a look in the next semester. Uh, uh, so my mother went to the uh, director of the school, and she told him that she wouldn't teach new history, which was completely crazy because actually uh, my father didn't work and uh, she was the only uh, uh, history teacher of this kind of uh, position which was not in the Communist Party. And so it could meant whatever. Um, so, and actually she got almost sick because uh, she thought that uh, Stalinistic time uh, are coming back and uh, they would be arrested. And my brother was six years old, my father didn't work, and actually all our friends are in danger. So, uh, but my mother uh, was going to, uh, actually she took more classes and she taught and taught, but she uh, felt more and more vulnerable and when Jan Palach uh, burned himself in the uh, main square of Prague, uh, strangely enough, she was teaching uh, medieval time, actually medieval history, it's not only medieval, and so she, uh, she was talking with kids about Jan Gus, and uh, instead of Jan Gus, uh, uh, she was talking actually about Jan Palach. I was thinking the whole, uh, the whole life, uh, and the kids were 13, and uh, actually my mother has many, many students around here. It would be my last speech. Um, um, uh, um, and, but the only class I know completely was this class. And actually she told me the story just uh, uh, three months ago. I don't know why. And so she, she was talking to these kids about Jan uh, Paloch who burned himself like one week uh, before uh, this class. And all of them are still in our life, all these kids, and um, they are much older than I. So, and it was her last class in, in, in that semester. She went to the uh, uh, psychologist or whatever, and it can, maybe some of you can imagine what does it mean in Soviet Union in 68. Uh, it's even more dangerous than <laughs> this class. Um, and fortunately, she met uh, one Jewish old uh, woman who closed all the doors. And she just told her, uh, you know, 
I, I can't teach anymore. I, I can't accept this uh, situation in my country. I, I don't know what to do. And, um, and she closed the door and she said, uh, kids, you don't know we live in a fascist country. And so it was a sort of revelation. But anyway, uh, she, uh, she took her in, in the hospital. And it was really a, a miracle. And uh, put my mother for three months it was her uh, only holiday in her life, I think. Um, for three months in the, in the ho hospital with a cancer, uh, with, with, with the, in the oncological department. So my mother was with 17 people who were dying and she was the only healthy. So three months uh, and uh, after that uh, she got out and I was made on the labor day. And uh, actually, we connected all that uh, just three months uh, ago. And uh, so I am really a, a s sort of embodiment of teaching in troubled, <laughs> troubled times. And also, <laughs> and, right, literally an embodiment. Yeah. And also perhaps have, yes, are offering us another perspective <laughs> about, you know, about oh, nice fear. Speak. Yes, about, about fear and... Uh, Repression and, and the different ways it, 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 it plays out and moves into your into your body. Uh, I I guess I think maybe one of the points that that comes up here again, especially yes, from what Francine and and Rosamond was saying, but in some ways you know that hospital ward becomes it also is, yes, is this question then maybe of, of sanctuary and what we, you know, what do we mean by creating in troubled times, whatever those times are, uh, sanctuaries or, if you will, safe places, safe spaces. Um, what, you know, if, if, what, what does that term actually mean to you? When, I mean, it's obviously extremely contested term by now. Uh, how safe should the university be, uh, especially when it comes to talking about ideas um, for students to express themselves? I mean, so again, when you're teaching, how do you understand that that term of, of a safe space? Is it something you want to create, and what does it really mean to you and your students? I may be actually first going to just respond to what you were saying in the sense that I know one of the other, and, and forgive me if I'm jumping, if you're, if you're yeah. actually going to ask this question, but one of the questions that came up was actually about teaching in other places, yeah? And, um, and I'm, inter I'm interested in that in part because I also come from teachers to a degree on both sides in places where teaching is not paid very well but is deeply respected. And people look to teachers to talk about what is happening in the moment. Um, and even you know, poets um, who are sometimes dismissed in this country and the places that I have connections to, if you tell someone you're a poet, they say, great, give us a poem. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> you know, that's your contribution to society. And, and what makes you a poet is your ability in that moment to give a poem. It's not a book. <laughs> It's not a teaching position. If you cannot produce a poem in that moment, then you are not a real poet. Um, so I don't, I don't know if, if you want to talk a little bit more, if you have any thoughts about um, the, the, situ the situation of, or the contribution of teaching in other places as well. Well, uh, I have to say that now when I heard the word sanctuary, it no longer has an abstract meaning for me. It has a very concrete yeah. meaning for me. And and one of the things that's happened at Bard, which I'm very proud of and proud to be associated, is that uh, there's a chapel at Bard, which has been a sort of school building for years. And now that chapel is being reconsecrated at, so that it can function as a sanctuary for undocumented students who need a place to go. So that because it's understood that that the, um, it's less politically acceptable to invade a religious sanctuary than a school building. 
So students, and we have a number of undocumented students who can go there if this is what it comes to. And, and I think now, honestly, that that's the most important thing that's going on right now. I mean, the way in which immigrants are being treated and the way in which the mass deportations are happening now and everything we can possibly do to stop that. I mean, the, the lying that's going on about the way these deportations are happening, the mass roundups that are going on randomly and you know, right here in Queens and so forth. So everything we can possibly do to stop that from happening, to stop families from being, being torn apart and so forth, I think we have to educate our students. I think we have to work in our communities. I think we have to do everything we can to write about the situation, to work for the situation, because it's a, it's a crisis that's happening right now, right this moment, and beyond all, everything we like to think about what we're doing as teachers, as purveyors of literature and so forth, it's happening right now. Families are being torn apart. And, and we, each of us, have to do whatever we can to prevent this from happening. So I'm, I'm very proud to be associated with an institution that's really stood up to say, this can't happen here, we'll do everything we can to stop this from happening here. I wish they could go there to stay forever and be, I mean, to go until people can figure out how to get lawyers, until people can figure out how to get help, uh, to stop them from being deported that moment, which is what's happening all over, you know, all over now, yeah. here in New York or upstate where I teach. So, so a place of just temporary, reasonable, san literally sanctuary where they can be safe until something, pe until people can figure out how to help them. We, we're going to actually, we're, we're being very experimental today, uh, which means that uh, we're not doing a Q&A just because we have so little time. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just you're all going to go off and think about these questions. Yeah, yeah on, on that concept, I mean, I think that, the, the, that it's absolutely imperative for individuals and institutions to think about how to respond to specific situations and um, CUNY is actually providing free legal advice to not just our students but our, our students' families, which is really wonderful. But what I worry about is that in some ways, again, the masking of how much can actually be done um, and also the masking of the everyday reality, right? So I'm a tenured professor. I have in many ways more privilege than my students. When people think I'm a student, people usually think if, if I'm not dressed properly that I'm a janitor um, or that I'm a student myself, right? And so in terms of <laughs> the, the, the privilege, what well, means I know how students get treated, which I think is an incredibly useful mm -hmm. thing for um, information for, for a professor to have. But in terms of you know, talking about the university as a safe space, I often am encourage, I encourage people, you know, if you're a lawyer, there are particular things that you can do in your field right, and for people to kind of beware of, of stepping into, into fields that they don't know that much about while they're actually not kind of cleaning up their own space, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think that's just, a, that was one of the places I, I, I sort of was wanting to go with, with the conversation eventually about, you know, well, what do we really mean when we say sanctuary, you know, given the very real limits of what can actually be provided or what can be, you know, or, or what is sort of obfuscated in terms of power and powerlessness. So what, can we think of it in a, in, a, in a larger sense, sanctuary as something maybe uh, that is less, le less legalistically defined. Um, universities have been very clear, I don't know, maybe not Bard, you know, NYU, Cooper, th these are institutions have been very clear about that they don't want to be called sanctuary precisely because they say, well, we're, you know, that, that means we're promising something that we can't deliver. You know, if ICE shows up on campus and if there's a court order, there's nothing we can do. We can give you these, these are, you know, we, we all hand these out to our students about know your rights, know where to go, know who you can turn to. But given that that demand is out there, how do we as 
people, members of university committee, s respond to this demand for sanctuary? We have one more minute, guys. Oh, is that it? <laughs> oh, really? There's no pressure. Yeah, okay. We, we, we'll, well, that's we needed we'll to get to later. sanctuary. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I'm just very grateful that my students, right. who I know are undocumented, feel that the university will do everything, that, the college will do everything they can to protect them. That's, I mean, and maybe in the end they can't protect them. I mean, that's probably likely that in the end they can't protect them. But, but at least knowing that they have that kind of support, that the faculty is behind them, that the administration is behind them, I'm... I mean, anything else would be horrifying to me. I mean, to teach at a place where that was not understood, I, I don't think I could teach there. I don't think I could be associated with it. So I'm, at least I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think, again, you know, CUNY does a lot of amazing things. We also have a, a, a student population, part of whom is homeless, right? And so they may not, you know, they, they may be getting legal assistance from the university, but um, I just, you know, absolutely, we have to step in in this moment, but all of the other things <laughs> that, are, that are getting lost, you know, the fact that because of the retrenchment, we still have exactly one woman of color teaching in the department of more than 50 full-time faculty members, and so the, the, the volume of things that are getting ignored in favor mm -hmm. of lip service to something that may or may not actually pr be provided is concerning to me. Yeah, that, so, so are you telling us we're, we're basically concluding? <laughs> so I think, but maybe... Good that, luck to everybody. Maybe that is, that is the, 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 the challenge, right, to, to, to think about what, what makes sense for us to be able to do and what makes sense to point out about what, what we can't do, and maybe that does say something about creating space uh, for students to start understanding uh, about those, something about those, those barriers. Okay, well, this was indeed a lightning round. It was just designed to uh, provoke some thoughts and also to introduce you to these three extraordinary women writers and teachers. And um, thank you. And